Hi everyone, it's Ren here. It's good to see you guys. I hope you're well today. Today we're going to be talking about philosophy and how NI dominance, among whom we count INFJs, might be in the future pushing the discipline towards a transformation. Now, before I move on to my topic, let me remind you that I have written a book on the INFJ type, the ecstatic soul. Look at this beautiful cover. Now, you might also see that there are cats there. Like you might see just one cat, but in fact, there are two of them. And I don't really trust those cats. So as in not to knock this book over. So uh, if that happens, you're warned. Um, the, the book is the deepest investigation to the INFJ that currently is on the market. It's available for less than $10 in ebook and paperback format. All the links to all the Amazon websites are in the description box. If you have any question, you ask me. Great reviews, good sales so far. Okay, so obviously this video is going to be a little bit um, speculative. We're going to be looking at <clears throat> the influence that uh, NI dominance in particular have on a discipline called philosophy. It's interesting because when we think of um, N-types as opposed to uh, sensing uh, S-types, we can use a variety of different adjectives, abstract, big ideas, looking at possibilities, um, not con connected to concrete sense experience and so on and so forth. One of the adjectives that uh, we may use is that um, N-types tend to be more philosophical in their manner of relating to the world and uh, they might, uh, in addition to that, and as an encapsulation of that, have uh, a pronounced interest in fields such as philosophy, um, fields that uh, sensing types may be attracted to, but let's, let's say that they're a little bit less likely on average to, to be drawn to those because they'll, they'll likely be thinking, what's the point, why am I doing this? Now, if we look specifically at the uh, domain of Western philosophy. Western philosophy is a domain that, um, as I suggested in, in, a, in the previous video, is constantly in movement, is constantly shifting. And this is something that you can contrast with uh, more Eastern philosophies and Islamic philosophies. Um, Eastern philosophies, for example, tend to be, uh, they, don't, they don't experience those shifts, constant shifts all the time. They're, uh, evolution, there is evolution with it, within such a thing as Buddhist thinking, for instance, but a lot of the basic teachings of early Buddhism are still there and they have not been um, called into question to the extent that, you know, uh, these core teachings have lost their meaning meaning or meaningfulness to, to the everyday lives of, of, of people of a Buddhist persuasion, for instance. Uh, this is very different in the case of Western philosophy because, again, like I said in the previous video, you'd be hard pressed to meet someone who would describe themselves as an Aristotelian or as a Platonist or as a Neoplatonist or as a, you know, as a Thomist, as in a follower of Thomas Aquinas, although I'm sure some Catholics would identify as Thomist, or as a Cartesian or as a Humean or as a Kantian. <clears throat> so you can really see that in the case of Western philosophy, there is always a movement forward. But if the hypothesis I've been laying out in recent videos is correct, this is linked to the fact that the creator of the, or the sort of Kickstarter of the Western philosophical tradition, Plato, was an alienated INFJ who essentially came to develop a dualistic metaphysical uh, view of the world, divided between the world of ideas, perfect forms, timeless forms, and the world of appearances, corruptible, ever-changing, and ultimately unreliable with this constant reliance on the metaphor of sight for being able to see through the appearances and into the world of ideas, being aided rather than blinded by the light of the sun. So you always have this reliance on the metaphor of sight, which I think has been in, in the history of introverted intuition and, in, and it's used by people of all strands, including thinkers, including philosophers, has always been defining its self-image in the West in relation to the sense of sight. Um, but I think that an argument could be made, and I hinted at it uh, recently, that in the 20th century and the 21st century, uh, Western philosophy is undergoing some kind of transformation spurred on by dominant intuitives. And to be completely fair, 
Among these dominant intuitives, there are also any dominants, which is really interesting. And I'm still trying to figure out uh, how I could explain that influence from a, a Jungian viewpoint. Um, because ultimately, what's really interesting about what Jung has to offer in this respect is that in, Jung will say something like, the disagreements between different views of philosophy, Western philosophy, can be explained at a level which is very different from those big abstract uh, differences regarding the nature of substance or the origin of essence, but rather in terms of their cognitive makeup. And in a sense, the cognitive makeups determine the uh, uh, worldviews of the, of the thinkers to such an extent that they are the main force in um, causing the disagreements to happen in the first place. So if we follow that Jungian uh, line of thinking, we have a very interesting um, perspective to gain on the evolution of philosophy in the West, because you can essentially come to see it as uh, the evolution of uh, different conflicts, different wars and victories and defeats by, pe by people and schools of, of, of uh, led by uh, particular individuals of certain types. So you could think of, you know, certain his parts of the history of philosophy being dominated by NI dominance and other parts dominated by TI dominance, some particular offshoots dominated by maybe censors like ISTJs, for example, have had some influence like Thomas Hobbes and his book Leviathan uh, is an example. So you can look at the history of philosophy through that lens. Is it the only lens? Of course not. But it's an interesting lens to use and to see what we can derive from it. Now, if we again agree that Plato is the originator of Western philosophy and that Plato was by all counts an INFJ, we have to keep in mind that uh, the NI dominance at the heart of the of the Western philosophical tradition has never completely disappeared because Plato has never been completely overcome. He's been overcome to an extent, but he's not been overcome at least until very recently insofar as people are still in the West and it's very, very different from what's happening in the East um, obsessed with this idea of an ideal realm, a realm um, that is somehow perfect, inaccessible to pure experience but that can be reached by thought or a particular kind of life. So obviously for the Christians, for the Jews, and also for the Muslims, I have to say on this front, there is the, the world of the divine. Um, for Cartesians, uh, people who are maybe not self-titled Cartesians these days, but who are inheritors to the Cartesian tradition, they would imagine that something like mind is uh, that world substitutes for the world of uh, the Christian God or the Jewish God, the world of thought as opposed to the world of body, which would be the world of appearance. And these dualisms, you can find them in almost any West, type of Western philosophy you can think of. In, in Kant, it's the world of the thing in themselves, the world of the noumenal world, again, as opposed to the phenomenal world, the world of appearance. And even for um, British philosophers in the 20th century, who claimed that to have surpassed the divide by looking at language, by looking at philosophy as through the lens of the analysis of linguistic statements and propositions. What happens is that the language and their philosophy ends up being reified, turned into a substance that becomes in effect the scheme, the ideal perfect domain where things are unchanging. So it almost seems as if Western philosophy cannot escape this dualism initially posited by the alienated INFJ Plato, which is really fascinating to think about. But um, I think that this is only a hypothesis, it's only a prediction, I'm not sure about it, I'm not sure because history has its own ways uh, and it likes to uh, falsify our predictions about what's going to happen in history. It's not an exact science and especially not a science about making predictions, but we can have some fun trying to predict things and I do think that since the latter half of the 20th century and, and, and maybe more than ever now, Philosophy is finally undergoing a transformation in the West, which is not simply a transformation as in one particular framework being overcome to be replaced by another framework that has an inherent dualism at its core, but actually a calling into question of this very dualism and a genuine and possibly successful, we'll see, attempt to go back towards something like monism, for example. But more specifically, maybe a concern not to even bother about calling things dualistic or monistic, to just say essentially, you know, metaphysics itself, as, as tempting as it might be, metaphysics, metaphysics itself is a way of trying to escape into this timeless world, which 
we can hope to look at from afar if we have the right pair of eyes. If Heidegger, an I dominant Heidegger, is correct that it's possible to think of being as um, a matter for all the senses, not just sight, but also hearing, touching, tasting, smelling. If Wittgenstein is correct that INFJ and I dominant Wittgenstein is correct that uh, philosophy is always spoken from the perspective of a language game, and therefore that whenever you're trying to talk about philosophy from a metaphysical viewpoint, all that you're doing is speaking from the register of a particular language game that others can speak from. And it's not possible to escape from the rules and the implicit conditions of a language game to a kind of God's eye view where you can look down at the local language games as manifestations of an ideal, perfect game. If Wittgenstein is correct that this is not possible, then this really calls into question the whole promise of metaphysics. Of metaphysics as this promise to leap beyond time, leap beyond space, and reach the domain of the eternal. But if philosophy really undergoes that transformation, and people like Richard Rorty and many others, Donald Davidson, and many continental philosophers, if they follow down this path, I think what you're going to end up seeing is something that could be called post-philosophy or something like that, where or post-metaphysical philosophy, where philosophy becomes concerned not with this realm beyond, the first inheritance of Plato, but with trying to invent, trying to figure out uh, as many new vocabularies to describe things as possible, to think of itself almost as something like literature, but with a different vocabulary, always trying to spur thoughts in new direction and make people pay attention to new problems and trying to be more in touch with problems that we currently face. What does philosophy have to say about our postmodern world? What does philosophy have to say about the importance of social media these days? What does it have to say about contemporary politics, about the problem posed by global surveillance? What does it have to say about whistleblowers? What does it have to say about responses to pandemics? This is what we would like philosophy to do, not necessarily always to talk about a metaphysical realm beyond. And by inventing new vocabularies, in order to look at these things from a different angle, maybe from a deeper angle, philosophy will still have something to say, but it will be from a one world perspective, the here and now. And what's fascinating about it is that in my estimate, the two main originators of that possible new turn, one on the continental side, Heidegger, the other on the analytic side, Wittgenstein, are both NI dominants. So it's really as if a tradition was started by Plato, lasted for over 2000 years, and the way in which it might eventually be overturned will again be done by NI dominance. What do you think about this? Do you think this narrative makes any kind of sense? Or do you have a different view? Do you think philosophy might become post-philosophy as a result of the work of NI dominance? Drop me a comment, a like, and consider subscribing, guys. Ciao, ciao.